Um, for those of you who I don't know, which I think is just two of you actually, <laughs> um, I'm Laura Barnes. I'm the librarian. Uh, I'm a, one of the institute librarians at the Prairie Research Institute. Um, and I'm embedded with ISTC, so that means I was the ISTC librarian before they started moving things around. So, um, and I decided to do this when um, Ideals, when the University Library first um, first started Ideals, which I was trying to remember how long ago that was. I think it was like six or seven years ago, maybe a little longer. Um, we had Sarah Shreve, I had Sarah Shreves come out and talk to us about what Ideals is, you know, why it's a good idea to use it, uh, and that kind of thing. And we've had a lot of turnover since then. It's been a while. So, um, and, and I think things like, um, resources like this are um, getting much more commonplace, and it's not quite as unusual, so I figured it was a good time, good time to do it again. So let's see if a remote works. Yay! So what is Ideals? Ideals disseminates, preserves, and provides persistent, reliable access to the research and scholarship of faculty, staff, and students at the University of Illinois. In Ideals, you can find articles, working papers, preprints, technical reports, conference papers, presentations, and data sets in various digital formats. Um, each of the units of the Prairie Research Institute has a community within Ideals. Um, I know that ISTC's publications are, have all been deposited in Ideals, um, including our out-of-print publications and some that were never published in print. Um, we got final reports and of, of projects that we'd funded, and for one reason or another, a, a report was never physically published. Um, but we went back this last summer. Nan I worked with Nancy to uh, to get to get the, that that material in there. So we have a pretty complete publications record of the history of the center currently existing in Ideals. Um, I know the Natural History Survey has most of their publications in Ideals. I, the Water Survey, I think, does their own archive. I don't know if they've done much in Ideals or not, and I don't know that the geo survey has either, um, although I didn't check. Um, it's the ideals is organized around communities which correspond to scholarly or research units such as schools, departments, labs, research centers. Um, when we all came into the university and became the institute, um, the institute became the, the, com the, the larger community under which ISTC, the water survey, natural history survey, and the geo survey all have sub communities. So what can you deposit in Ideals? You can deposit all types of scholarly research materials, preprints, previously published material, if the publisher will allow you to do that. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Working papers, technical reports, presentations, data sets, and other scholarship not usually submitted for peer review publication. So basically, any kind of scholarly output, any kind of output that you do that you think people might want to have access to at some point, um, you can deposit in Ideals. I use Ideals to deposit presentation slides. I go out and give a lot of talks to um, businesses and organizations about going green. And it's an easy way for me to put this. I can put the slides up on Ideals. They're, they're always there. All I have to do is give out the URL when I go talk, and I don't have to print out lots of handouts. It's much more sustainable that way, so I get to walk the talk. Um, that's a good thing. That makes me a little more credible when I go out and, and talk, do those presentations. What formats are accepted? Basically, whatever format your research is in. Um, they prefer formats considered preservable, so things that are openly documented, supported by a wide range of software platforms, widely adopted, um, lossless data compression or uncompressed, and doesn't com contain embedded files or scripts. And um, on the IDEALS website, they have uh, publication guidelines, or guidelines, format guidelines, um, and they prefer for example, open office documents rather than Word documents because Word is commercial, open office is open access. But you can still deposit Word documents. When I deposit like my presentation slides, um, I save them as PDF first, which is actually not on their top list of formats because, again, that's a commercial software product. But, uh, but, it's, but that way, um, people can't just download my PowerPoint slides and then steal them. <laughs> so. Um, they do accept audio, video, and video files. Um, they don't allow, they don't have um, the capability to do streaming, however. Um, so people would have to download the audio or video to their computer to view it. Um, and ideal staff have to load files over 500 meg, and that, um, 
you know, audio and video files. Video files in particular tend to be pretty big. So those are just some considerations. If you're planning, I would suggest if you want to deposit audio or video that you contact Ideals and work, work with the staff to make sure that that's not going to be a problem. Copyright considerations, because I am, after all, a librarian and we're concerned about that sort of thing. Um, you retain your copyright when you submit items into Ideals. Um, you give the university permission to distribute and preserve your submission, but you retain the copyright. If you publish in a journal and have signed away your copyright, which if you have published in Elsevier or y in Elsevier or a Wiley journal or you know one of the scholarly publishers, the odds are high that you may have already done that. Um, some publishers give their authors permission to deposit published articles into repositories like Ideals, and more and more publishers are starting to allow that. Um, partly because the federal government is starting to require um, that federally funded research, the National Institutes of Health now requires that um, NIH funded research be openly available after, a, I think it's a year long embargo period. So, um, so publishers are becoming much more willing to let scholars um, pro provide access through institutional repositories. You can check the Sherpa list of publisher copyright policies and self-archiving to see what, the, what a journal's policy is. Um, you can also check by publisher, but because it sometimes varies from journal to journal, it's always better to check by journal. And there's a link to that in the little handout I gave you. Um, ask your publisher whether you can submit your work into the institutional repository. Or neg and negotiate to submit your work. Um, CIC has an author addendum, which you can use to negotiate for retention of those rights. So, as you're, um, you know, at, when, when you agree to publish an article in a journal, um, just see if they'll, if they'll sign that addendum, which will allow you to deposit. Um, you can also negotiate directly with the publisher. And SPARC, which is um, part of the um, National Association of Research Libraries, um, offers use, useful resources for authors. And there's a link to that on your handout as well. So can you place material someplace else if you've already deposited it? Um, that depends on the publisher. If some, because some publishers, as you know, will not accept material made available elsewhere, even if it's not formally published. Um, you can check with potential publishers to make sure that you can deposit a preprint, for example, into Ideals or a working paper or something like that. So now I'll talk a little bit about management of and access to deposited items. Can you make changes once you've deposited an item into Ideals? No. <laughs> um, Ideals doesn't support sharing different versions of a paper except in specific cases and isn't meant to be used like NetFiles or Dropbox or, or services like that. Um, it's supposed to be a final resting place for your digital work. Um, you can, however, submit both a preprint and a postprint to Ideals. So, um, but you, you can't, you know, a, as you go along revising, you don't want to continue to, to deposit. Um, you, a collection, however, a collection administrator can deposit new items on the same ideals record. I actually do this with my presentations because, um, as we all know, if you do, if you do presentations very often, um, you know, they're kind of a living document. You revise as you go along. You make changes. Um, so... I, what I do is I just go in and deposit a new file on the same record. It just, I think it keeps the database a little cleaner. Um, collection administrators can also make changes to item metadata. So if you make a typo in a record or you leave a word out of your abstract or something like that, um, you can go back in. We can go back in and fix that. Yes? You can log in with you if you log in with your NetID and password, um, that'll get you in, and then I can add you as a collection administrator for ISTC's community. I can add you as a submitter for um, the we have ISTC. There's an ISTC staff publications and presentations community subcommunity or collection rather within Ideals, um, and I can add you as, as a submitter for that. Um, Well, I would prefer that people do it themselves because I don't. I, I already have lots of things to do. And I don't want to get. I don't want to get slammed. I am the depositor, though, for um, all of our 
all of our our the center's reports. So, you know, if we publish a new research report or a new technical report or a new fact sheet or something like that, um, I deposit those into Ideals, and then I also put them up on our website. So, but for yes. I'm getting, yes, 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 but I'm getting to that. <laughs> so withdrawing items from ideals. Um, you can have items withdrawn from ideals, but they don't, want to, they don't like to do it very often. Um, it may include discovery of a copyright violation. So if you deposit a post print and the publisher comes back and says that shouldn't be up there, um, ideals will take it out. Um, or publication of an article with a publisher that doesn't allow previous versions to be available. Um, only ideal staff can withdraw items from the repository, so that's something you would have to, to negotiate with them. Um, if a publisher contacts them and tells them about a contact violation, though, they will just take something out. Um, items can't be withdrawn because the depositor or author is moving to another institution. Um, ideals collection policy gives you the right to deposit your articles in that new repository you know, if, if you change institutions. So if that institution has an institutional repository, you can redeposit your materials there. But, um, but they, won't, they won't withdraw from ideals because you decided to, to, move, to move someplace else. Yes? Sometimes there is, sometimes, I would be, for example, for our research reports, I'm the depositor. But for purposes of this, generally, it would be the author, right? Yeah. Yeah. Most units on campus, um, faculty and staff are, if, if they're depositing in ideals, the authors are doing it themselves. When an item is withdrawn, a copy remains in an inaccessible archive as specified in the deposit agreement. Any item that has existed within ideals may have been cited via its persistent URL. Ideals will always supply a tombstone when the item is requested. The tombstone includes a statement, the item you're trying to access has been withdrawn from ideals and will include a link to the feedback form for more information. Withdrawn items are not going to be available for harvesting, um, by, for harvesting or indexing by search engines. So um, they're kind of off in their own, little, their own little area. So who has access to ideals? Anyone can access the deposited items unless you place access restrictions on them. Ideal strongly encourages you to allow open access, because that's the whole point of, of the repository, unless there are special circumstances which require such restrictions. And I know, for example, some INHS reports are restricted because of specific location information about endangered species. Um, so there, um, the collection administrator can access the reports. Everybody else just sees the metadata for the report. So now I'm going to, I am going to go ahead and do a demo of Ideals so you kind of get an idea of what it looks like, the interface, how you can search, um, how to deposit, um, stuff like that, and then I'll, I'll answer questions too. Um, once you log in the first time, I can add you to the authorization list to deposit within the ISTC staff publications and presentations collection. Um, so just let me know. If you go and log in with your NetID and password, and then I can go and pull your name out and, and make sure you end up on that list. And I have to check to make sure that I remember how to do that, because I've never done it before. So, so let me get out of here. And we will go to ideals. And then on the handout, which, Jen, you came in late. <laughs> it's okay. Um, on the handout, I have links to, to Ideals, to the, F, the Ideals. Ideals has a really good FAQ um, and help files, and then the, to the ISTC community. And then I also um, have some links to some copyright resources and information for authors. And I also sent out a, uh, an email this morning to ISTC staff, but I'll mention it because we have a couple of people from, from um, other parts of the institute. Um, Sarah Shreves, who is the ideals coordinator and the coordinator of the scholarly commons at the U of I library, is doing a brown bag and um, a workshop this week on author rights. 
and retaining copyright and how to work with publishers to retain your copyright so that you can do things like deposit and ideals. Um, the the um, workshop is this afternoon. I think it's at the main library from 3 to 4. Um, the brown bag is Wednesday at noon in Illini Hall. And if you're interested, if you guys are interested, I can send you, send you those dates um, when I get back to my desk after, after lunch. So is that something you've got you two of your interest? You, would you? OK. Um, by the way, I'll put in a plug also. The workshop is part of the Library Savvy Researcher Series. And they do training on. RefWorks and Mendeley and author rights and I mean pretty it's targeted at grad students but faculty also find it really useful um, and they usually offer those workshops several times a semester both in the fall and the spring um, I highly recommend those um, if you want to learn more about what resources the, what the wide range of resources the university library has available as you're doing research so ideals This is Ideals, um, nice and friendly. The main page, um, you can browse by title, author, subject, date, or community. Um, under my account, log in to my Ideals. Um, just like I said, you just use your NetID and password to do that. Um, everybody should have a NetID and password because you have to use it for a lot of things. Um, and then there's there, the help section is um, also incredibly useful. Um, in fact, I used it to pull together a lot of the slides at the beginning um, and you can see they have top downloads so it's kind of neat if you make the top 10 download list um, and then recent editions so this is just a scrolling <coughs> list and you can see the third one down that's a talk that I deposited last week for um, those are slides I deposited last week for, for a series of presentations that I've um, been giving at public libraries throughout the state um, Let's go ahead and I will show, and I'm just going to show the ISTC community because that's who most of the audience is. But I mean, they're going to look the same. That was just you, John. OK, so what you get, you get the communities. The, the list of communities is here. We're all listed under the Prairie Research Institute. Um, the, C, the Critical Trends Research um, Assessment Program projects or publications are in their own community under, within the institute. So if you ever need those CTAP reports, this is a really easy way to find them because if you try to go to DNR's website and find them, it's quite difficult. <laughs> um, and then there's a, there's a community for institution public, institute publications and documents. I don't know. Well, I don't, I'm not sure what's in there. Let's see. Nothing. Or at least it doesn't look like it yet. It, there's nothing in that collection yet. I think that was set up um, just in case, you know, as perhaps as things maybe start to come out of the institute more broadly or collaborative publications. So within ISTC, we have um, we have several different collections. We have annual reports. Um, Library reference guides, which originally started out as PDFs that lived on our website. Um, they, I'm actually now converting those over to um, lib, lib guides using the university library subscription to that product. Um, our RR series, that's our research reports. Um, sponsored research program unpublished project reports. Those are, like I said, we had some project reports that never quite made it to fi their final published report stage. But this is a really good way to make that research available to people. Um, that means then that a lot of a lot of those reports were things that were published in the late '80s and early '90s, but may still have some research value. Uh, staff presentations and publications. Right now, that's pretty much the Laura Barnes section of the web of, of Ideals um, because I just routinely deposit all of all of my stuff in there. Um, I would love to have some company, so. Please, um, as you publish, you know, think about depositing in ideals. Um, our TN series, that's our fact sheets. TR series is technical reports. And then um, the, we have two sub-communities. We have the Great Lakes Regional Pollution Prevention Roundtable. Um, we do have some archives of the, our, the Glipper's Link newsletter. 
Um, and then the Sustainable Electronics Initiative, which no longer exists, but there were some publications that came out of that initiative. So those are also deposited there. So when you go to the ISTC main page, you can see you know, recent editions. And then at the bottom, you can see download statistics. So you can see that over, since we've been depositing things in ideals, we have over 43,000 um, downloads of, of publications from this community. And then you can also get statistics, get, get, um, get a statistics, have a statistics report generated, um, which can be a nice ego boost if you're, if you're a, uh, you know, if, if you want to see how many people are actually looking at your stuff. Um, but uh, it's also really nice for annual reporting and things like that when we need to know how many people have looked at our publications, for example. If you browse by author, you can, and I'll just do me because you can enter the first few letters. The more specific you are, of course, the closer it gets in the index. This is all the publications that I've done. And the advantage of being able to do this is if you want, once you deposit your publications and ideals, you can um, do browse by author, copy and paste that URL and put that on your Vita. And then just say, oh, say all of my, or on your website or wherever you want to promote your research and say, all of my research publications are available here. And you're pointing them to one place. Um, another advantage is that um, the URLs on ideals are persistent URLs. So once you have a URL assigned to your stuff, it's never going to change. Um, you know, as websites get reorganized among the various um, surveys or the institute or perhaps a department goes away at the university or merges and consolidates with something else, um, you know, URLs change, which means that links get broken. So if, you're, if, you have, if your publication has been cited, um, has been cited in another publication and it's pointing someplace that doesn't have a persistent URL, then people won't be able to find your stuff again without having time for it. So that's another advantage of depositing ideals. Yeah? Could, could one have multiple attributes, um, name of the author, maybe the research area? So if I want to you know, search for publications by Sharma, but in a certain research category as opposed to all of his publications, you can, there's, there's a search box up here so you can search. You don't just have to browse. Okay. Um, and then there's advanced search. So, so you can search full text, you can search the abstract, you can search the title, okay. you can search the subject. And subject, you, when you deposit, and I'll show, I'll, I'll actually go through the pages so you can see how the forms to see, so you can see how to deposit. Um, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a field for subject keywords. So, so yes, you can do that. Uh, if you want to do multiple, you know, multiple search terms, you would uh, you'd use advanced search, or you can just type stuff up in the search box and see what you get. Um, I tend to like to be a little more refined because usually when I go for to something like this, I'm looking for something pretty specific, and I don't want to wade through a bunch of irrelevant stuff. <laughs> Again, I'm a librarian, so, so let me go back. So. We'll just go, I want to show you a full record so you can see what it looks like. Um, at the top is the title, bookmark or cite this item, that's the persistent URL. Um, and then the file is the actual file. So if you want to download this PDF, you click on the, the, you click on the link to the file right here and it works just like any, any file PDF download. Um, but then you can page down and you can see author, contributor, and all of those are linked. So if you wanted to see what other, um, what other reports have this particular subject, you can do that. This may be the only one, yes, this is the only one. But that's another way that you can, you know, if you want to find things that are, that are like items that, like known items, that, then you can click on those, those are live links. So you can click on those. And then it tells down here, it shows down here what, what collections this appears in. So I think now let's go ahead and log in.
so that you can see what it looks like when you're going to deposit something. You're welcome. Okay, so I'm now logged in, and you can see under my account um, the selections changed. So my ideals will take you to the section. If you if you start to deposit something and for some reason you get interrupted, you can save what you've done so far, so you don't have to go back and do it again. Um, evidently, that happened to me here. I have an unfinished submission. Um, you can also start a new submission. And you can also do that from over here. Once you're logged in, submit a new item will always be on this left, under my account, will always be on the left side. So let's submit a new item. And I'm not actually going to put anything in. Actually, I might. I know we won't be positive. We'll cancel it. I'll clear it out later. You can put this presentation out there. I could do that, except I don't have it saved as a PDF. I don't, like I said, I don't like to do my own files, or I don't like to do um, PowerPoint files. That. Yes. So, but when you do want to run it as a presentation, don't you need, a, need it in PowerPoint? Well, <laughs> Ideals is really to provide access to other people. If you want to run it as a presentation, I mean, you can deposit it as a PowerPoint. Um, I'm just, I, and for this presentation, I don't care so much. But for like the green business workshops that I do, there's a lot of my intellectual effort that went into that. I sure. mean, and when you're talking about scholarly research, generally you want it in some form that's not easy to write, plagiarize. Okay. <laughs> so, because as we all know, plagiarism may be the sincerest form of flattery, but in the research world, it's also probably not a very good thing to do. So, we'll go ahead and put and say we're going to deposit. The academic committee, I know of some chancellors who lost their job under that accusation. Right. But you, but you can, if you do deposit it as a PDF, if you deposit PowerPoint slides as a PDF, um, generally you, all you get is the slides. So if for some reason, you know, you're going to give a presentation and you've deposited an ideals and your flash drive has failed and your laptop crashed and, you know, you really need, you have to have a backup, you could run, run it off just from a PDF. You just wouldn't be able to, get, you wouldn't get all the animations and all the nifty stuff that you get with PowerPoint. And you can go back and delete it. Well, you can't actually, once it's deposited into ideals, you can't, yeah, you can't, you can't delete it, so yeah. So this is the license. Um, it's actually fairly straightforward. Um, it's not like, in other words, it's not like the iTunes license, it's what I think currently runs to 80 pages long and people just click accept. Um, so, you know, it's just making sure you're you're just saying basically that you're agreeing, you know, that, that you retain you retain your rights and that you have that you have the rights to deposit to deposit these things in in, a, in an institutional repository like Ideals. So confidential information, proprietary information, export controlled information, that kind of thing. So. Anyway, I'll let you guys read that later, but it's actually, I mean, as far as license agreements go or as far as, as agreements like this go, it's fairly straightforward and easy to understand. So that's something. So if you don't grant the license, you have to obviously exit. So we will grant the license. So public, open access, that's what's recommended. Um, I have never deposited anything that's not public open access, but if you want, well, we'll just click it so you can see. Um, you can make it visible only to U of I users. You can make it visible to a smaller group of users, and then Ideals contacts you to determine what that set is. And you can also embargo it. So maybe it has to be restricted for the publisher. The publisher agree, your publisher agreement says that, it ha that it's embargoed for a year. It can only be available on the publisher's website for a year. So after a year, it can be publicly available. So you could go ahead and put months till public release, 12, and after 12, 12 months after the date you deposit it, it becomes publicly available. So that's nice. You don't have to remember to go back 
and make it publicly available later. And then it, they ask reasons for privacy restriction. So you, ha so you have to say why. So we're going to make our, our publication open. So first thing you do is put in the author or creator. And then if you want to add, if you have more than one author, which I know quite often when you're publishing scientific papers, you have usually more than three authors quite often. There, there's a lot of collaboration that goes on. Um, after, the, after each author name, you click Add More. And all that does is moves the first one down. And then you can take it off. That's what the trash can is. Or you can edit it. So if you, may, if you, go, if you look. You know, you're reviewing your work and you say, ooh, I made a typo, I spelled his name wrong. You know, you can go back and fix it. Um, additional co contributors, if, you, if um, maybe you're, it's a book chapter that's part of a large, you know, that had, the book had an editor, um, you can put that in. Um, title. Usually you only have one title, so you can add more, but I don't think you need to do that in this case. So date, we'll do today. What is the date today? 26? Yes. It's Monday, I know that. Okay, so subject keywords. Um, you have to put in subject keywords. Um, you can... They, they have actually, um, they have a, a, when you start typing, they'll, um, they'll pop up a, a browsable menu that will show, that will give you selections um, of, word, of keywords that are already in there. So, let's see if I can make it do that. Sometimes it's kind of slow. Institutional repositories. And then, because I'm a librarian, again, so after each subject term, you click Add More if you want to add more than one. So, and I'll go back, I'll probably go back and edit these later. Um, so this text, because I am going to deposit, I'm basically going to do a record for these few slides. Presentation, and then Abstract or summary. An abstract or summary isn't required, um, but it's helpful. And if your paper already has an abstract, you can just cut and paste it and put it in there. Um, all of our reports either have an executive summary or an abstract. So um, again, cut and paste, dump it in there. And sometimes you have to do a little bit of cleanup because uh, it doesn't always copy pretty. But, uh, but that's not a big deal. Um, I'm going to leave that blank for now, just in the interest of time. Language is English. Publication status. Um, in this case, it's unpublished. Um, if you're submitting a journal article, for example, um, it would obviously be published or submitted for publication. Um, Peer-reviewed, no, not in this case. Um, but if it is submitted to a peer-reviewed journal, you can click yes. Um, most of our research, our research reports are peer-reviewed. So all of our, so you know, that, that bid is, set, is checked is checked for those. So in this case, and as you start typing, like I said, it pops up, so that's handy. Um, you, pro you may never use the series name report number field unless maybe, you're maybe you have an EPA grant and you're publishing stuff as if your, your publication was published as an EPA report. You could put the EPA report number in there. Um, obviously, for our research reports and for um, like the natural history surveys reports, um, we put the series name and report number in that field. Um, additional identifiers, if you happen to know the ISSN of the journal that you're publishing in, that's always useful. Um, ISBN, um, if, if the publication exists somewhere else on the internet and you want to put that URL in there, you can do that. Uh, do, does everybody know what a DOI is? A DOI is Digital Object Identifier. It's a, uh, it's sort of, it's the, the publish, the 
the, the publishing world's version of a persistent URL. So generally, when you have an article published in a peer-reviewed journal, you'll have a DOI number associated with that journal. And if you put HTTP colon forward slash forward slash dx.doi.org forward slash in front of that DOI number, that creates a link that's a persistent link to, that, to the citation and abstract for that, for that journal. Um, and generally, we'll just redirect you right to the publisher's website. So it's pretty handy. So you can put the DOI in there. Um, OCLC number, OCLC is um, like worldcat.org. It's a national, it's actually an international um, cooperative cataloging database that libraries use. So um, if your book has been published and you want to refer people to the OCLC record for that item, you can do that. Um, Bib ID would be like if it were deposited in, or if it were, um, for instance, available for the university library, you could actually copy the bibliographic ID out of the U of I catalog. There's a URL for that. And put that in there. It's just basically the idea is another way that people, you know, it's another piece of information that people can use to get access to your work. If you want to put the sponsor grant number, if you're, you know, if you're grant funded, if it's a publication that's come out of grant funding, um, you can put that information in. Um, copyright statement. You can, other than the license that um, Ideals grants, um, you can copyright things um, under Creative Commons license, for example. Um, or if Elsevier perhaps has retained copyright to your work, you might want to note that um, in there. And in fact, if it's a published, if, if you're um, depositing a published journal article, your publisher may have a copyright statement that they want you to put into that field. Um, I have never run into that. Then again, most of the stuff that I've deposited is either things that ISTC has produced or things that I have produced myself. Um, I do. I have started using the Creative Commons license uh, for presentation slides and things like that um, because that way it's a little more clear what people can actually do with the content. So next, this is the part where you upload the file. Um, and it's, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. You just browse and uh, click on the file you want to upload. In this case, I'll go ahead and click on this and upload it, and I'm not, but I'm not going to actually click to deposit the publication because I don't particularly want, want, necessarily want this in there um, as a PowerPoint. But, and then if you want to add a description, say you're, say you're uploading the paper, and you also want to upload your data sets, uh, which, as you know, NSF is now requiring data management plans for their grant for their for their grants. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of that with other government agencies. Um, one of the things you can put in your data management plan is that you're depositing your, you know, your, your reports, your project reports in Ideals, and you're uploading your data sets to Ideals. So you're making that data publicly available. So that's a way that you can comply with the data management plan requirements also. Um, but if you're uploading, if you're, if you're wanting to do, like I said, a paper and then maybe a data set, you'd want to put in there What's, what's actually in the file. Um, in this case, sometimes I'll, I'll put presentation slides, for example, for, for something like this. Um, for the talks that I give on green business, I, ha I, um, I upload the slides and I usually upload the bibliography on the same record. So one will be marked bibliography, one will be marked presentation slides. Um, and then if I do a revised presentation and I upload that to the same record, then I just put the revision date. It just Again, to be able to get a little more information. So we'll go next. And then it asks you to review your submission. So if you made a mistake, you can go back and fix it. Um, so correct this information. If you want to change, if you change your mind and you want to change the access settings, um, if you made a typo in here, I always read very carefully because sometimes, you know, I, I, have I seem to have trouble typing champagne and spelling it correctly, for example, or, Ill or I'll get an extra L in Illinois or something like that. Um, so, and then you can correct, you can even correct the file. Um, I am going to save and exit. I'm not going to complete the submission because, like I said, I want to do something with that later. So we'll save for now. 
So like I said, depositing is pretty straightforward. Does anybody have any questions at this point? No? Okay. Anything you're curious about or? Yes. So what you just did, you can use that as a temporary holding place? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then. <coughs> and then you can delete it. Right. And then you, and then you can, right. Until you have completed the submission, you can delete. Once you complete the submission, you can't take it out. You can contact ideals and say, I want to withdraw this item, but you have to tell them why. Um, and then it doesn't really get deleted, it just is made inaccessible. Right. So once I, since I've saved this instead of, instead of completing the submission, now you can, now it's asking me, do I want to discard it or do I want to save it? Now, I'm going to say save for later. And then this is the My Ideals section that I showed you before under My Account. You click there. And this is where your unfinished submissions go. So, um, you know, if, if, like I said, you get interrupted or you want to think about it before you deposit it or you want to check and make sure that it's okay with the publisher or whatever, you can get everything in there, but you don't have to complete the submission until you're ready to do it. Any other questions or? Is there anything else anybody wants to see related to ideals? Then I think I'm done. So.